Welcome to another episode of Mokina's Front Porch, a Mokina history podcast with Matt Gaelic and me, Israel Smith. All right, this week we are talking about the history of the Mokina Campfire Girls. Yes. So, Matt, I would guess, unless people have read your blog, they probably not <laughs> heard of the Campfire Girls. Probably not, no. Um, but everybody's probably heard of the Girl Scouts. Yeah, and w- exactly, yeah. Kind of, would you, how, how would you compare this group to what we know as the Girl Scouts today? Yeah, they were pretty similar. Uh, they uh, were just a group of younger girls. I guess the Campfire Girls uh, would maybe be, I'm not sure what the cutoff age is for Girl Scouts, but uh, the Campfire Girls seems or seem like they were a little older than most of the Girl Scouts mm-hmm. I've ever met. Uh, they being like, nowadays we would consider them high school age. Yeah, but uh, Girl Scouts are more like grade school uh, typically, right? Start yeah. younger and yeah, um, not as many as you get a little older. Yeah, exactly. Um, but it's interesting, like with being in this area, as we get mm-hmm. into the story, you know, some of the things that they did, um, you mm-hmm. know, even uh, you talk about uh, doing a camp out down by the Hickory Creek or, yeah. you know, these guys with the Boy Scout, the local Boy Scout group hiking, you know, to, uh, uh, you know, I forget if it was Joliet or a faraway town. To yeah, me. no, definitely. Uh, it was, you could tell the, you know, it was a time when people were more used to being in that outdoors life compared yeah. to now. It was, yeah, absolutely. Um, but as we'll hear in the story, you know, these, these are um, the children of the families that we know really a lot of the history of uh, our town Mm -hmm. uh, come from, you know, a lot of the, you know, which, you know, we'll kind of get into a little bit. Um, So that was really interesting to see, you know, we're used to hearing about their parents and that. And now, you know, these young kids um, did some really, really uh, cool things and really. um, Yeah, they did. All right. Made an impact on our, on our village. Yeah. Yeah. Just as their parents did. uh, They also left their mark as, as kids, basically. So adolescence, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. this is a really uh, a really neat story. Anybody that is interested in scouts now, I think, would be interested in, in hearing this. So let's get into the story of the Mokina Campfire Girls. And yes. Matt first published this story on April 30th of 2021. They were in their late teens at the oldest, but their community spirit and the vim and vigor with which they worked for Mokina are still worthy of our respect to this day. Their hearts beat for our community. The Campfire Girls, a group of adolescent ladies that were very similar to the modern-day Girl Scouts, did many good deeds for the village in their short existence and inspired those around them. Their members and leaders were a solid representation of our town, and while they were all ordinary girls, their impressive list of accomplishments elevates them to the status of local heroes. In the years before the First World War, The scouting movement swept the United States, which culminated in the official formation of the Boy Scouts of America in 1910. Mokina's boys formed their first troop in 1914, and as they grew successful in their endeavors, their sisters looked on and, feeling the same drive to do well, decided that they would not be left behind in the shadows. Having been founded in 1912 as a direct answer to the Boy Scouts, The Campfire Girls of America came to town in 1915, when our village's first official camp was formed. This group formed out of a pre-existing girls club called IRB, the initials of which stood for some meaning long since lost to the ages. On March 6, 1915, a meeting of girls was held at Front Street's Beckstein Hall, and a group of eight members called their organization into existence. These founders, whose names read like a who's who of Mokina in this time, were Alma Beckstein, Esther Bolzald, Cora Cooper, Agnes Frisch, Olive Goither, Eunice Hacker, Ruth Niethammer, and Myrtle Oswald. The girls ranged in age from 15 to 17 and represented a cross-section of the community, being the daughters of the pastor of St. John's Church, a Front Street merchant, and a railroad worker, among others. So, Matt, as you mm-hmm. see in the article, that that list is kind of a who's who of Mokina. Yeah, it is. So can you kind of go over and just, uh, you know, who, how would we recognize uh, these names, these family names? 
Sure, yeah. Uh, for example, Alma Beckstein, the first girl I mentioned, her father, whose uh, name comes up a little later, uh, he was uh, W.H. Beckstein, who was the owner of Mokina's Grain Elevator at the time, who uh, also was a, a grain dealer, coal dealer, things like that. Uh, Esther Bolzold, her father, France Bolzold, was the pastor of St. John's Church in this time. Okay. Uh, Cora Cooper. Her a much older half-brother was uh, Elmer Cooper, who was the founder of the Cooper and Hostard Ford Agency, uh, which uh, at this time was not yet in existence in 1915, but it was right around the corner from being born. Uh, and who else do we have? Um, Agnes Frisch, her father, John Frisch, was a, a railroad worker, later was a constable of Mokina, who the uh, readers of my book, the 1926 Orland Park murder mystery, will remember John Frisch as having That's been, right. yeah, as the constable of Mokina in the 1920s, who worked very often with Walter Fisher, the subject of the book. Uh, who else do we have? Um, uh, the Hackers. Hacker, of course. Uh, Eunice Hacker, her grandfather, Carl Hacker, was the subject of an earlier podcast uh, and his uh, Civil War service. Uh the listeners will remember the surname Neathammer from our piece on the history of the old building that stood where Dina's Barbershop used to be. Uh, that old building having been burned down in the 1920s, unfortunately. But Ruth's father, uh, Mr. Neathammer, kept a, a hardware store there. So And lived on Midland, uh, right? Yep. Was, was their house off of Midland? Midland and First, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Olive Goither, uh, a very well-known uh, Goither being a, uh, a well-known local surname, uh, having been here almost since day one. Uh, Olive's father was uh, a school board member, a uh, prominent local gentleman. And uh, interestingly, Myrtle Oswald, her father, Julius Oswald, was a concrete manufacturer who has the credit of – Having laid or put in whatever the correct terminology is, the majority of the first concrete sidewalks uh, in Mokina. Really? Yeah, yeah. Now, yeah. is that – because one of your blog pieces has the oldest piece of pavement in Mokina. Oh, yeah. Is that – do you think that would have been laid by by him? Yeah, that, yeah, that okay. was that – yeah, in fact, Julius Oswald's little um, – I guess we could call it a seal – is still uh, visible in that, that length of sidewalk. Very interesting. Today. Yeah, yeah. So just about every one of these girls um, came from a family that has some sort of greater claim to fame. Yeah, how how interesting to see. You know, as we read through this, it's just, yeah, it's just filled with, you know, the people that, that made this town. Yeah. Um, and is. whose history we're, we've been sharing uh, since we started. So. Absolutely, yeah, definitely. All right, definitely. very interesting. In getting on their feet, they got a boost from member Alma Beckstein's mother, Emma, a true Mokinian who was known to help worthwhile local efforts, while the girls also received help in getting their charter through her father, W.H. Beckstein, the village grain dealer. For their guardian, a position not unlike a troop leader, the new campfire chose 26-year-old Margaret Semler, the wife of Mokina's correspondent to the Joliet News. While she was newly married and had only lived in town for about a year at this time, Margaret showed the heart she had for her new home by being the guiding light to this new group of well-doers. At the outset, Mrs. Semler's husband, William, noted in his village column of The News that the young ladies are taking a keen interest in the new organization and are displaying remarkable enthusiasm and are determined to make their society a power for good in the community. The original eight members of the Moki camp would quickly be joined by more local girls, and before long, 15 members were attained, the requisite number to make a camp. The young ladies christened their new assemblage the Moki camp, after the mythical Chief Moki, a Potawatomi man said to live on the prairie where Mokino would later be born. Before long, the new camp adopted a star as their official symbol. The campfire girls followed the law of the campfire, their creed, which stated, Seek beauty, give service, pursue knowledge, be trustworthy, hold on to health, glorify work, and be happy. 
According to their laws, the young ladies were not allowed to accept any monetary donations and had to work for any money their camp earned. At the meetings of the group, camp business was discussed, with songs being sung, as well as a time for games and socializing. The gatherings rotated at the houses of the members, and in some cases, such as when they met with Cora Cooper or the sisters Alice and Dora Andresen, they commuted en masse to their farms north of town on spring wagons. Staying true to Chief Moki and the namesake of their camp, the girls favored Potawatomi imagery, donning fringed gowns and beaded headbands that they wove themselves. The Moki camp were a busy group of girls. Typical of their activities was a bonfire held in the wooded thickets alongside Hickory Creek on April 17, 1915. The camp's full membership formed up at the home of Margaret Semler on Neetamer Avenue and walked to the woods with their lunches in bags which they tied to sticks, which in turn were hoisted over their shoulders for the march. Once their council fire was started, the girls roasted hot dogs, and in the words of Joliet News correspondent William Semler, they tramped through the woods and had a pleasant outing. Barely a week later, the camp reconvened at the Semler place at the crisp hour of 5 o'clock in the morning, this time for a sumptuous breakfast of roasted marshmallows. Also being a vigorous, energetic lot, that same day, members Carrie Koppel and Eunice Hacker hiked from Mokina to Joliet, finishing the trek in about three hours. Around the same time, some of the other girls made a round trip to Frankfurt by foot. Not content with just camping on the outskirts of town, the girls set their sights on renting a cottage at the New Lenox Methodist Campground in the summer of 1915. After liberally peppering Mokina with colorful posters advertising the event, they put on a bake sale at Paul Rinke's Meat Market on June 19, 1915, to raise money for the rent. And when the day was out, the Moki camp counted $19 to their name, or close to about $500 in today's money. The young Mokinians got settled in at the campground at the end of July and enjoyed their time out of town despite damp weather. While in our neighboring community, the Mokina Boy Scouts hiked to New Lenox to visit the girls, where 10 pounds of hot dogs eventually disappeared over the campfire. Aside from various activities offered by the churches, the Mokina of the First World War era was not exactly a place brimming with opportunities in the way of fun for local youth. Seizing the initiative, the Moki Campfire Girls sought to change that. At the beginning of summer 1915, a committee of four members visited member Eunice Hacker's father, Mayor George Hacker, and asked for his permission to build a tennis court in the village. They got his word, and a plot of land north of the Methodist and St. John's churches was chosen. By early August, the work was done, the new playing surface being complete with a double court net. The court was open to anyone in town who wished to use it. Each player only had to supply their own ball and racket. Hey, Matt, where would we find that uh, tennis court? Do you know where that's yeah. located? Yeah, sure. So so let's see. The area back then that was north of St. John's and the Methodist Church would have equaled roughly, let's see, a year into the future they were building the Emmanuel Lutheran Church around there. So this was probably what is today the kind of grassy area that's just north of what is today St. John's parking lot. Okay. Uh, there were um, various things there over the years. And uh, in fact, around this time, sort of like early 1900s into the World War I era, that that little piece of uh, land up there was every so often kind of referred to as the Mokina Park uh, because uh, later on there was a little uh, platform built there uh, where the local band would play. Hmm. Uh, there, uh, there was a homecoming celebration held there around this time uh, that was a, a precursor to our later uh, homecoming celebrations, which a lot of residents will remember. But yeah, to answer your question, yeah, it was in that area over by St. John's, kind of a, just north of where their parking lot is now, that kind of grassy area that's over there. Yeah, that's Well, that was my thought when I saw it. I was like, well, it's kind of like a precursor to the uh, park district. More there, or less, yeah. No, absolutely it All was. Right, great. Yeah, definitely. 
Mokina headed into the summer of 1915, and the 4th of July appeared on the horizon. Always a day of great gaiety and mirth in our village, that year the Mokina Men's Club was at the helm of planning the festivities. As things were coming nearer, the campfire girls approached the businessmen of the club with an idea, something new for that year. Why not put on a parade? After all, it was years since the village had seen one, the last parade for the 4th having been held in 1903, and the girls reasoned that it would bring a crowd to town and liven things up. The young ladies suggested to the men that the town businesses should each enter floats in the procession. Traditionally, this was done using horses and wagons, but as cars were slowly edging them out of traffic, it was resolved that it would be an auto parade, a first in the history of the town. The parade was a huge success, wending its way through the main streets of town, complete with a Charlie Chaplin impersonator, and ended at Copple Grove, just south of town. Once the revelries kicked off at the Grove, an area just south of town complete with a dance pavilion, the Boy Scouts and others took part in the day's program. The Moki camp was in charge of the flag-raising ceremonies, and their leader, Margaret Semler, read a patriotic verse. One of the Andresen sisters, both of which were camp members, read the Declaration of Independence. Different types of games rounded out the rest of the day, and cash prizes were awarded to the best floats from the parade. While those of local businessmen Frank Lease and the Sippel General Store ranked first and second, the Campfire Girls landed in third place and were given $2 for their efforts. Matt, where uh, would Capel Grove have been? Oh, very good question. So Capel Grove uh, was right where Woodland Circle is nowadays. Okay. So that was, we talk a lot about uh, that Woodland Circle area. So that was, yeah. and that was another kind of like park. Uh, you could say so. Area. With, okay. Yeah. Yeah. There was a, a um, it, it's a whole long history, but there was a, long story short, there was a, um, a, a covered enclosed uh, dance pavilion there for many years. That was a, was a pretty popular place and big picnics and events and things would also be held out there as well. Oh, very good. Yeah. Okay. Over the rest of 1915, the work of these Mokina youths stirred up so much interest among the girls of town that a second campfire was established in April 1916. For their guardian, the new group chose Mrs. Mabel McGovney, a former school teacher, and thus forth christened themselves the Potawatomi Camp, again hearkening back to our rich native past. The list of their deeds is impressive and inspiring. Taken as a whole, the apex of the girls' achievements was their planning and staging of Mokina's first public Memorial Day celebration in 1916. Originally known as Decoration Day, this reverent occasion was born as a direct result of our great national bloodletting, the Civil War. Originally observed as a day in which to honor the legions of Union dead of the North, it was first formally marked in 1868, three years after the conflict's end. Over the years, village residents observed the occasion privately and without great pomp and circumstance. Correspondent Semler even decreed that the occasion had been neglected in our midst, adding with a sting that the churches of the village and the various societies have apparently never given the matter any thought. As the Civil War was still very much within living memory in their day, Mokina's campfire girls had a deep recognition and appreciation of the day's meaning and sought to bring it into the light. They first felt deep reverence for the occasion in May 1915 when they ventured into the tangled overgrowth of the old Denny Cemetery and decorated with flags and flowers the grave of Charles Denny, who marched as one of George Washington's men in the Revolution. Previously, this patriotic duty of adorning his and the many graves of Mokina's Civil War soldiers was shouldered entirely by aging local veteran John A. Hatch, who not only made the rounds on his own, but also humbly took care of all the associated expenses out of his own pocket. The Campfire Girls had great expectations for what Memorial Day could be in Mokina, but in order to put on any kind of event for the day, they needed funds. To solve this prickly issue, they put their minds together, and after much brainstorming, it was decided to stage a play. After a period of rehearsing together, the curtain went up on February 26, 1916, at Mokina Hall, to the premiere of When the Cat's Away, a one-act comedy. 
As the doors at the hall opened that cold night, the town folk streamed in with high confidence in the girls, as their work on the previous 4th of July was still the talk of the community. They would not be disappointed. The full complement of campfire girls were there, attired in their Potawatomi garb, gracing a stage that was prettily decorated with a latticed background entwined with roses that gave the scene the effect of a rose garden. All of the lights in the hall were turned down, leaving the whole auditorium swaddled in a reddish glow that emanated from the footlights covering of red paper and the charcoal-fueled campfire in the middle of the stage. Sisters Eva and Louise Graff, both members of the Moki camp, gave a piano duet, and rounding out the evening were readings performed by Miss Catherine Mitchell and her pupil, both having come to town from Joliet. Once again, the Campfire Girls made a big splash, and the whole program was a success. The planning for Memorial Day began in earnest after the play. Helping the girls in their endeavors were some enterprising church people and some of the village's old Civil War veterans. On Sunday afternoon, May 28, 1916, John A. Hatch took the Potawatomi camp under his wing, and together they went to Marshall Cemetery, where he showed them the graves of old Union soldiers, which the girls then decorated with flags and flowers. The Moki camp followed suit that Tuesday, and did the same at the St. John's and St. Mary's cemeteries, as well as at the historic Denny Cemetery. The big day came for the both of the Mokina camps on May 30th, when once again the Mokina Hall was used for the event, this time being festooned with flags and bunting. The young ladies invited three of the village's hardiest Civil War veterans, including the aforementioned John Hatch, as well as Griffin Marshall and Elijah McGovney, who were escorted to places of honor on the hall's stage by the girls. At two o'clock, their program started with stirring music being furnished by the village's Boy Scout band, to which the campfire girls sung Strew Fairest Flowers, along with the Community Ladies Quartet, who performed several selections as well, including Tenting on the Old Campground, an old Civil War tune. The speaker of the day was Rev. J.M. Schneider of Joliet, who gave a rousing address in three sections. First, he hailed both campfires for their work marking the day in our village, and then he moved to the ideals of preserving the Union for which the audience's parents and grandparents had so perilously toiled. The Reverend then moved to a topic that was gaining in earnestness in his day, namely the brutal conflict raging in Europe that we now refer to as World War I. With a heavy note, he warned the folk of Mokina against a spirit of militarism, and said that while he was for America being on the defensive, he stated that he did not feel that it is right for mothers to raise their sons to be a soldier and fodder for cannons. To wind up the day, Mrs. Grace McGovney read an honor roll containing the names of every Civil War soldier buried in Mokina. While admission to the program was free, the Campfire Girls accepted donations from generous residents and even set up a candy booth at the hall. At the end of the day, they counted $26 in their coffers. As the United States entered World War I in the spring of 1917, both the Moki and Potawatomi camps kept up their good deeds in town, backing up our local doughboys by working arm-in-arm with the Red Cross's efforts on the home front. Alas, all good things must come to an end. For reasons long since disappeared into the ether of the past, the Mokina Campfire Girls dissolved in the spring of 1918. One by one, they got married and started families, but in the words of their erstwhile guardian's husband, each always cherished the fond and pleasant memories they had made with the camp. Over the years, the girls held reunions where old times were relived and old campfire songs sung, with these gatherings happening on an annual basis at least through the 1920s. The last known reunion took place in Mokina in the 1960s, when the girls were now mothers and grandmothers. The campfire girls of our village went above and beyond in their endeavors for our community. They reached for the stars bringing holidays to us that we now all too often take for granted. May their memories be immortal. The girls' can-do attitude and their Mokina spirit 
come along once a generation. Even though over a century separates us from their deeds, they have set an example that would be a worthy one for us to follow. Who of us will take up the torch? This is such an interesting story, and there's yeah. so much in it. Like we said, you know, with as far as you know, town people. But one of the things I thought was really cool, and it's in the blog, and we'll uh, we'll share it on Facebook as well, is the picture, kind of the art that you have here. This oh, campfire yeah, yeah. girls photo. That was pretty cool. Yeah, um, it's it's so neat. Um, do you know? Any idea like where that came from, or I don't actually. Uh, th- there's actually sort of a funny story as to where that came from. Well, I guess it's not funny, but um, I don't have any pictures of the either of the the Mokina camps sort of in their garb as a group. Um, there are pictures of the individual girls by themselves or with class pictures and things like and that. And the parade photo, right? Or this uh, I, also you have right. the. the the black and, or the black and white photo from the the Fourth of July parade. That, I assume, right? that is correct. Yeah, the uh, the picture of uh, Mr. Beckstein's uh, car on Front Street with um, Margaret Semler, the camp guardian or the guardian of the Moki camp, at least. And uh, some of the campfire girls are in the back seat. I know Carrie Koppel was one of them. Uh, and that's I, such a cool picture. It I is. Mean, it's that, a very cool. Picture, what yeah. What's in the background? Do, can you do you know? Yeah the the building that's visible in the background is the one we talked about where the um, Neathammer Hardware Store was. So that building that's the at least the most visible building in the background uh, burnt down in 1929, and that uh, was later the site of what a lot of us will remember as Dina's Barber Shop. Got it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But uh, the the really. Um, kind of colorful interesting picture i just pulled off the internet okay um i just was looking for maybe some kind of artwork that the the national uh organization had done maybe at some point and that one really struck my eye um because the uh the girl in the picture uh is kind of how i imagine the mokina girls because she's kind of um is wearing something that kind of looks almost like a like a potawatomi uh, type uh, garb or uh, some, yeah, it looks some like, other. And there, it looks like they're sitting down by the Hickory Creek too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I thought it was a very fitting picture. So yeah. I, very much. Do we know at all like when that organization uh, ceased to exist? Actually, believe it or not, the campfire girls still exist. They do. They do. Um, they, they don't have anywhere near, you know, unfortunately the membership that, uh, you know, the girl scouts do or the boy scouts do, but in, researching to write this piece when it was back on my blog i just googled campfire girls one day and they have a website and they're wow they're still uh, out there and um it turned out that uh, someone that i know that i had been on the will county historic preservation commission with had been a campfire girl back in the 70s which i had had no idea of uh, where was that what what town was that in that was i believe that was in the city it was in chicago okay. surprisingly it's um um but yeah, that and she went on to explain that nowadays a lot of the um, the different campfire uh, groups and actually campfire now uh, welcomes boys, okay. so they just call themselves campfire. Uh, but they are nowadays, from what I gather, they're affiliated with lots of Lutheran churches. Okay. Uh, um. So I don't know if they are if they were sort of taken over at any point by the Lutheran Church, but. They it, I, the vibe I kind of get nowadays is that a lot of them are involved with churches. Okay, yeah. Which I mean, our Girl Scouts uh, and our I think our Boy Scouts meet yeah. at, still here at the local at St. John's. They do and, indeed. Yeah. Um, which uh, so I looked up and there are currently there looks like there's five Girl Scout groups or troops. However, they mm-hmm. uh, in Mokina. Yeah. Yeah, it's, currently that's going strong. Yeah, and um, as well as you know, the Boy Scouts I know are, are quite a few as well. Oh, sure, yeah. Um, but you know, these campfire girls, how interesting! You know, they only were around for eight years, right? But in that short time, you know, these girls made the first first community observation of Memorial Day. That they did indeed. The first ever Fourth of July parade. That they did, yeah. Which With you cars. know we look on today and it's it's one of the biggest events in our town yeah and absolutely. i don't know maybe it wasn't consistent since then but it's it's neat yeah. to look back at you know that was something it that is. they pushed for uh yeah. in our town yeah so i mean their their influence is still being felt over 100 years absolutely. later which i think is really cool so 
Yeah, they're definitely a, a very um, – they did a lot of good in their short time they were organized among us, and uh, we're still seeing it today. And I, I thought that uh, – my thoughts and when I wrote the piece for the blog was that I wanted a, sort of like everybody in Mokina to know about them because I think that they they – their names and their deeds deserve to be remembered all these years later. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So mm-hmm. when we look back, the, uh, cause the Girl Scouts were kind of founded right around the same time. Yeah, they were, um, yeah. And, uh, but we don't know of any, uh, if there was any Girl Scout troops at that time or maybe how, how far after, uh, yeah. before they came to Mokina. The but, Girl Scouts, I believe uh, the Girl Scouts, I know for a fact that they did not coexist with the Campfire Girls. The Girl Scouts later sprouted up for the first time in the 1920s in Mokina. So just a little bit after the Campfire Girls. uh, And um, they sort of kind of uh, disbanded a little bit and then were reborn again. Mm -hmm. So uh, which is the same thing that happened with the Boy Scouts, their first troop. Um, was formed here in 1914, but it, it went defunct, unfortunately, mm-hmm. a few years later, only to be reestablished. Uh, I thought it was interesting that um, John Hatch uh, yeah. comes up quite a bit again in this story. He does indeed. Yeah, as yeah. you know, we we d- talked about you know the Hatch Hall in a recent episode. Sure. Yeah. Um, and I thought yeah. it was interesting too. You talk about the overgrowth of the Denny Cemetery. Right. Right. So. Yeah. Uh, maybe talk about that a little bit. Why yeah. Why was it in the condition it was or what was going on there? That's a very good question. Uh, wow, there's so much history uh, there. So for, for those of uh, us who are listening who are not familiar, Denny Cemetery is the historic name for what today we call Pioneer Memorial Cemetery on Wolf Road, sort of directly across the street from Aurelio's. Uh, and f- the cemetery for a very long time – went into a period of, I don't want to say it's neglect because I don't think anyone was willfully neglecting it. There just was nobody taking care of it because it was very, very old. All of the families uh, that had had people, had loved ones there, had either all died out or moved away. Uh, it was not affiliated with a church, so there was no sort of perpetual care going on. And in this period... Around the the World War One years, yeah, Denny Cemetery was was not in the greatest shape. It was uh, there's a photo from 1916 that shows the cemetery just with really high overgrowth, like you would almost not even recognize it as a cemetery. Wow. Yeah. When did not to you know get off topic of the story, but when yeah. when was that changed? When did it start being maintained? I would say uh, there always – basically there always was uh, or were periods of some maintenance. From time to time, the village board would hire the village constable to go in there and trim the overgrowth and stuff like that. Or uh, local people who lived nearby, like for example, the Benson family who lived, uh, Mr. And Mrs. Benson, who lived on McGovney street right there would take it upon themselves to clean up the cemetery. But the sort of a uh, jungle like, uh, look, I guess that the place had basically stopped for good in the 1930s. Uh, it was, and there's, like you said, not to get off of the topic of the campfire girls, but there's a whole long story behind this. I'm sure. I'm but, sure we'll talk in the near future. Yeah. about A lot of that history as well. I would love to, I would love to. Yeah. yeah. But the, the Mokina garden club, as it existed back then, took it upon themselves, uh, hmm. to take care of the place. Um, uh, not without other things happening, but, uh, yeah. And then after the garden club sort of ceased out of existence, uh, the Mokina Amvets, when they still existed, were taking care of it. And then at some point, the uh, village board took over. And then the um, the Mokina Women's Club in 1990s, must have been around 96 or 97, uh, took it upon themselves to restore the cemetery or at least as, as much of it as they could. And I believe some of them are still involved with the uh, at least the landscaping and things like that out there. So 
And the village has on their website a video which you're featured on of the oh. dedication of the uh, Denny. Well, oh, yeah. I don't know what you call it. It wasn't a dedication, but uh, do you remember what that event was? Yeah. If, if we're thinking of the same thing, it, it was when the Sons of the American Revolution, yes, yeah. yeah, the SAR came out a few years ago to uh it was a dedication to to dedicate a historic marker there detailing the life of uh charles denny our revolutionary veteran who's buried there very cool yeah very cool. yeah absolutely well uh get to get back to the campfire girls yeah um you know again this is it was it's, it's a great story that highlights this group of young ladies and I mean, that's what they were. These were high school, really yeah. high school age uh, young women. Yeah. And yeah, they um, man, they just found something they were passionate about and didn't let anybody get in their way. No, they didn't. Yeah. So what a great story for our youth, Absolutely. for the, the young young ladies in our town, uh, as well as everybody. Yeah, um, To Absolutely. take a message from these now uh, long past uh, women, right? I think they would, are they all? probably passed now do you think they they are they are uh i believe the last one let's see i'm looking at the names right now maybe i'm mistaken like for example i, I i'm looking at esther bolzald uh she was one of the charter members i'm not sure when she passed away she moved away hmm. she did not stay in mokina but in looking at all of them the the last one of the original campfire girls may very well have been uh olive goither who was uh, Olive Stillwagon after she got married. She passed away, I believe, in 1991. Oh, wow. Thereabouts. And she was uh, she was in her 90s. Yeah. Yeah. So she she may have been the last one. But yeah, unfortunately, they are, yeah, they're all gone now. Well, it was very cool that they still were getting together um, all the way up in into the 20s, 1920s. Yeah. Yeah, they, they or in the 1960s. I'm sorry, they were meeting up, you know, doing these reunions up to the 60s. Yeah, even up in the 60s. Yeah, most of that original group uh, was here in town for a reunion in the 60s, and there may have been some after that. Even I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I would, I would imagine that there probably were. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, to wrap up this story, it's not Campfire Girls, but very similar. Is like we talked a lot about the Girl Scouts, yeah. and as they're in town here, so. Matt, big question for you. You might not be prepared for this, Uh-oh. but <laughs> the Girl Scouts currently have 10 cookies they're selling. Oh, really? What are your top two favorite Girl oh. Scout cookies? Can you, yes. do you know them by name? First one is Easy Thin Mints. Yes. Which is probably everybody's favorite. That's my number one. Yeah. yeah, I love the Thin Mints. And um, now I can't believe I'm drawing a blank on what it's called, but there there is another one I like. Something is it something doodle or something snickerdoodle or something? No, not snickerdoodle. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have a memorized. Yeah, either. me neither. Yeah, <laughs> if if they were here and they had their wares on display, I would be able to point to it right away and say that's the one. Well, but, okay. Well, I agree with you on um, on the thin mints. <clears throat> Number two for me, though. Yeah, is yeah. The Samoas. Okay, those are good too. You know, yeah, and both of them. Have to be frozen. Okay. I go <clears throat> right in the freezer, and I think okay. you get them out of there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> crack them off. I, I've but, never tried that, but that's not, that does sound good. All right. Well, something to think about yeah, for next time. Absolutely. All right, Matt. Cool. Thanks for sharing this article. Thanks for having me. With March being Women's History Month, Matt and I saw it fitting to share this great story of the Mokina Campfire Girls. This summer, when we are all standing along the 4th of July parade route, Be sure to remember those Campfire Girls who organized the very first Mokina 4th of July Parade all those years ago. If you're enjoying our podcast, please be sure to leave us a review and please share our show with a neighbor or a friend. New people are discovering our show all the time and we've been getting some great feedback, so thank you for that. I'll leave a link to Matt's blog post about the Campfire Girls in the show notes. Also, be sure to check out our Facebook page. We will share some of the photos there as well. So thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time on Mokina's Front Porch.